over DNA uh, structure and function. Almost done with the semester. Uh, let me go grab the link for Discord. Discord. All right, guys. <clears throat> Go ahead and wait a second. Hello. Hope everybody's doing okay today on this glorious Wednesday. It's beautiful out today while we're all sitting at home. <laughs> One second, go grab a pencil. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> let's go ahead and get, uh, get started here. Uh, I want to go over this DNA stuff today. So we're, uh, we're now working in chapter 11 now. Uh, let me go ahead and pull that up. So, looks like I'm lagging a little bit. Hopefully it's not too bad. Uh. All right. So uh, we're going to go over nucleic acids today. I'm assuming that a lot of you guys have learned about amino acids uh, before in the past. I know a lot of you guys are taking your biology courses already. Um, I do want to point out that I like to focus on the chemistry side of it, not so much the biology side. Um, but you can't, the biology is unavoidable because this is the whole role of these molecules is the biology they do. Um, but let's go, let's go ahead and take a look at the structure here. Switch over to the file. So yeah, I'm in the PowerPoint here. All right. <clears throat> so the, the basic structure of uh, nucleic acids is that they are, as it says here, a string of molecules called nucleotides. And uh, they have three basic components. They are a five carbon sugar, uh, typically ribose, uh, phosphate, and a nitrogenous base. Um, so before I get into the nitrogenous base, I did want to talk a little bit about the sugar involved. So uh, here, uh, the, the main uh, sugars involved here are uh, ribose and deoxyribose and uh, the numbering on them. So let me uh, go ahead and switch over to my um, presenter camera right here. <clears throat> and I'm going to go ahead and do a little bit of a applied review of stuff that we did during the... Uh, carbohydrate discussion. So I'm going to go ahead and draw the structure of ribose. Uh, this is also going to be D-ribose as well. And I'm just, I'm just copying this from the PowerPoint. <clears throat> that and we have OH here and then OH, OH and then here CH2OH. Uh, so one thing that we can do uh, based off of the last chapter that we did, <clears throat> the carbohydrate chapter, you guys should be able to draw this as a straight chain. Uh, you also should be able to recognize, like, excuse me, this is the alpha or beta anomer. Um, so looking at this here, uh, anybody in the Discord want to answer, is this, is this the alpha or beta anomer of ribose? if you guys can get this. Alpha or beta anomer. Yep, this is the beta anomer. Uh, so the way we do this here, uh, we look at the carbon right here. 
Uh, one way you can point it out, it's it's the one that has the two single two single bonds of oxygen on it. It's typically how we can recognize the anomeric carbon. And this is the beta anomer. <clears throat> Uh, and going from the ring to the straight chain, uh, what we're going to be doing is we are going to number it this way. And I'm going to use the prime numbering for this today because this is the kind of uh, numbering we're going to be using in this chapter. So 1 prime, 2 prime, 3 prime, prime 4 prime, 5 prime. And then, <clears throat> so we know it's going to be a 5 carbon sugar. Like that. Um, the top part here, because we have an H coming off the anomeric carbon, uh, that's telling me that the top carbon, carbon number one, is an aldehyde. If you had something like an OH and a CH2OH, that would mean you have a ketone instead. Um, we're going to have three chiral centers. So three handed parts of the molecule. <clears throat> uh, the way I know that is because uh, these ones here on the bottom here, uh, these are handed portions of the molecule, so that's how many crosses we have. And then the very uh, carbon-4 here, that's also one of them, which is this one right here. So numbering, it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in the bottom. And our bottom carbon there is our CH2OH. Uh, we saw with these drawings here that uh, if the OH is drawn upward, it's left on this drawing. And if it's downward, it's right. So uh, the way this is going to work here, it's going to be right, right on the OHs. And then the D here is going to tell us the orientation on the, on the last one. So the last one, seeing that it's the, the D enantiomer, it's like that. <clears throat> so uh, there's your uh, D ribose as the Haworth projection or the Fisher projection. Uh, the main difference between uh, ribose and the other one of important is deoxyribose. Is that with deoxyribose, we have just hydrogens here and carbon number two. Uh, the rest of the molecule is the same. So I'm going to call this one D deoxyribose. Uh, which sugar is involved determines whether or not you are looking at a DNA or a RNA molecule, uh, nucleotide. Um, the question was asking about an OH going, so uh, this OH right here, uh, this, this oxygen is this oxygen. So when you're looking at whether it's like up or down, you're starting at carbon two. And that's here. Yeah, so this, this first one going up, so remember there were two possibilities where the OH was up or down, those were anomers. Uh, but these other ones are kind of fixed in position. All right, uh, so I want to point out here uh, that carbon, going back to the deoxyribose, is missing an oxygen. And then if you were to draw the uh, Fisher projection for this, they're going to look the same. Well, similar, except uh, we typically don't draw that part here. That, that's not a handed portion of the molecule. You need typically four different groups coming off. But I'm just showing you that to illustrate that the OH is missing. Like that. <clears throat> All right. So uh, going, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint now. And I want to go ahead and take a look at the nitrogenous bases that are included. So the nitrogenous bases that are part of this here, uh, let me get rid of that outline thing. that I got all of those out of here. All right. <clears throat> so sorry about that. So the nitrogenous bases here, uh, there's two different types of nitrogenous bases. Both of them are aromatic. Remember, aromatic means that you have the, the double bond system in the middle of the ring there. Nature likes these. Um, but it works out that we have two different types. Uh, if it's a two-membered ring, you know, you have two rings. So, so 
start, rather, if it's a two ring structure, it is a purine, and if it's a one ring structure, it's a pyrimidine. And uh, the kind of thing I normally do in class is for students to identify which category each of the nitrogenous bases belongs to. Uh, so let's take a look at this first set here. Oops, let me delete this thing. I thought, oh, sorry, I thought I got all these out of here. All right, <clears throat> so uh, here are two of the nit nitrogenous bases that can attach as part of a nucleotide in DNA. Um, they are adenine and guanine. Uh, these are both purines uh, because they have two rings. And I do want to mention that the right ring on guanine is still aromatic. Uh, we're not going to go over the reason why. We covered that in detail in organic chemistry. But that, that right ring is still aromatic. Um, the other types of bases are the one rings, the pyrimidines. There are three in this category. And that's uh, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Um, I am not making you guys remember all the names here. Uh, the symbols are typically good enough. And the symbols we use are literally the first letter of the name. <clears throat> when you guys go on into uh, biochemistry, uh, if you guys do, uh, some teachers make you guys memorize all the structures. Uh, mine didn't make them memorize all these. We had to memorize all the amino acids. But some people make their students memorize all, all of it. So uh, I want to go over now um, how... Well, the other piece here, before I go on to that, the other piece of the molecule for the nucleotides here is the phosphate group. So I want to go and piece together a nucleotide from our structures uh, that we have, and then we're going to review some reactions from earlier this semester, uh, most notably condensation reactions and some of the thermodynamic parts. All right, so uh, switching back over to the presenter camera. I am going to draw a nucleotide that is part of RNA. Um, actually, you know, I'm going to go ahead and shorthand uh, big portions of the molecule. So here, uh, this is our sugar molecule. Uh, notice I took all the other extra pieces off just for simplicity. Uh, but this is a five carbon sugar. And if you look at all the different structures for the uh, purines and pyrimidines, um, all of them have nitrogens in their ring. And one of the nitrogens typically has an H on it. And we have some ring. It doesn't really matter what it is right now. Um, what's going to happen here is we are going to get a condensation reaction between them. So we're going to lose a water molecule here. Uh, same thing that we, we did this in the past as well. Uh, I believe the last time we saw this was with amino acids uh, combining together. So what we're going to get here is that kind of structure happening, <clears throat> like so. All right, uh, so after we have this part of the structure, I do want to mention that we still have a CH2OH right here. So there we have our CH2OH like that. And then we also have phosphate groups that we're going to attach here. And the phosphate groups are going to do a hydrolysis with these guys over here. So it, it works out for your phosphate groups. I'm just going to show it like this. Like so. Uh, we are essentially going to get a hydrolysis happening right there. And we're going to get now our phosphate group attached. Like that. And then we have what O3, PO, and then yeah, this is all connected like that. So there we have our phosphate group, our sugar group, and our nitrogen group. Uh, when you have all three pieces combined, that is now a nucleotide. So nucleotide. Uh, this, this particular uh, PowerPoint does go over the naming. 
Um, I'm not going to be testing you guys on the naming, um, but I recommend you practice. You could practice the naming for structure drawing, that kind of thing. Um, but I typically don't uh, test on that, but I did want to talk about it a little bit be to put things into context. All right, so yeah, the slide here goes over all the different things that we just went over. I, I gave it a little bit more detail. Oh, they, get, they did it right here, the same thing that I did. So you do have the stuff in the PowerPoint as well. <clears throat> all right, so here for the naming on these. So it turns out that uh, uh, the identity of your nucleotide is determined by what the nitrogenous base is and whether or not your sugar is the regular ribose or deoxyribose. Uh, so make sure every, everybody's clear here. Uh, deoxyribose is the, ri is the version that's found in DNA and regular ribose is the version found in RNA. Uh, so uh, these are particular names here, the adenosine, monophosphate. Uh, what that's telling us the name, it's uh, by the adeno, it's, t it's telling you that it's adenine on there. And by saying adenosine, they're, they're telling you that it's a nucleotide. So notice how all, all of them say adenosine, guanosine, cytidine, that the ene part on there is telling you that it's part of a nucleotide. So you're, they're not telling you everything about it. And then if, you're, if you don't include the deoxy in front, it's implied to be the regular version. So the first name there I'm looking at right here, uh, this is actually AMP shown, uh, the regular version where the deoxy adenosine would have been where this OH is missing. All right, and uh, it works out where uh, taking a look at here. Uh, so looking at the deoxythymine, it turns out that uh, you don't typically have this one in, uh, in RNA, only in DNA. All right, are there any str uh, questions so far? All right. So it turns out that um, after you have your nucleotide, uh, these things will form in a sequence. And I'm actually gonna draw a little bit more detail on uh, the page down here, that the kind of detail that I like you guys to understand because we're focusing on the chemistry, is uh, the way that these things all connect. So I'm gonna shorthand some stuff, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna include my H's and OH's so you're understanding the full chemistry that's happening there. But we're gonna shorthand it a little bit just for the sake of discussion. So here we have a phosphate group and it's bonded to the sugar. Like that, and then I'm just gonna put N there for the nitrogen group. Uh, this is this is our nitrogenous base here. We can just we can draw just like a circle like that for this. Um, it works out where there is another OH right here, and uh, what this is gonna do, it's gonna connect to another phosphate group. that is on another carbohydrate. So I didn't want to draw all these molecules out in full detail because I want to focus in on, the, on what's actually happening. Uh, I do believe your textbook shows you the full structures for these if you want more detail. All right, so uh, here we have another phosphate group. Uh, these are going to undergo another uh, condensation reaction, and you can imagine that we can now basically build a long sequence of the sugar, the sugar phosphate backbone with the nitrogen groups kind of hanging off. And that's actually what the PowerPoint slide is showing you. Um, we'll go back to that in a second, but I just want to draw this out, what we have. So we have our phosphate group, the phosphodiester bond, and then we have the the sugar piece and the glycoside bond to the nitrogenous base. We now have an, uh, another bond between the phosphate here, and this is attached to another sugar unit. 
And this can just go, go on and on and on forever for as many nucleotides as you have, like that. Uh, the way that we uh, talk about the numbering, um, remember if we number the carbons, uh, the anomeric carbon is number one. So it's, and then we use uh, prime numbering. If you're numbering on the sugar, you use prime numbering. If you have no prime, uh, you're, you're numbering on the nitrogen piece. That's just the convention people went with. All right, so you all have primes on them because we're using, we're numbering on the sugar. Uh, so the connectivity that people like to think of it as is it goes five prime to three prime. So the convention is if you're reading a DNA strand, that's the, that's the order that you read it in, five prime to three prime. So we're going this way. If you're reading it uh, three prime to five prime, you're going this way. So the direction matters, left to right, right to left, that's the kind of thing here. And the thing we go with is five prime to three primes. Uh, you you want to remember those uh, numbers, especially for your biology classes, because I know they test you on that kind of stuff, on the, on the numbering on those. <clears throat> All right, um, here's the even short, shorthand version of it. And here we have uh, G to T, C to A, and we have our long sequence here. Uh, basically, what we're, what we're building up here is, is, is the genetic code. So uh, these are going to bas basically give us instructions on how to build proteins. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but the order of the letters is going to give instructions to, to proteins on what order to put the amino acids in when building an amino acid sequence. It all comes from the order on these groups here. <clears throat> all right, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and take a look at uh, this particular slide. So it turns out that when you have a DNA molecule, You'll basically have one strand, you know, going this way, one strand going the opposite way, and they line up kind of going in opposite directions. And that's what we're seeing here with the five prime on this top here and three prime here. So this uh, left one is going in the forward direction, and the opposite one's going in the backwards direction. And it works out where they are matched with a complementary base, and that's what this is showing here. Uh, so the general way this works is uh, every single possible pairing is going to have a purine and a pyrimidine, meaning that it's going to have a two uh, ring system and a one ring system. So three rings total between them. Um, what this allows, it allows the molecule to essentially be symmetrical down the middle because it's always going to be about this wide, uh, depend, no matter what two bases are together. You can imagine here if you had a purine matching with a purine, it would be uh, wider, and then a primidine with a primidine would be skinnier. So this way, if you're, if you're always having a two and a one, one to two, that kind of thing, it's always three rings wide, like so. Uh, the way that these are actually coming together, which we're seeing here with these drawings, is they are holding by hydrogen bonds, and the way, the way they hydrogen bond is different. So it, it, it turns out they have to match up exactly right, otherwise they don't form the hydrogen bonds. So here we have uh, adenine with thymine, A goes to T, and then uh, guanine to cytosine, G to C. Um, U isn't, isn't mentioned in here, U actually replaces one of them. Does anybody know which one U, uh, U replaces in RNA by chance? So uh, uracil, uh, U, it re re replaces one of these when it's an RNA. Does anybody know which one it is? Yeah, it actually replaces thymine. Yep, thymine is replaced in RNA to be uh, <clears throat> uracil. So a little bit different. All right, so uh, there's your, ba your basic double helix here. Um, we are going to go into uh, protein synthesis and replication here in a second. Um, but it turns out that uh, after you have the straight chain, uh, there is a little bit more detail and you basically get like, those coils get coiled again, and then, the, and then those new coils get coiled again. So you get a couple coiling uh, processes here and you eventually get a DNA packet. Uh, it's basically called a chromosome at that point. And it turns out that if you look at them, they have this kind of an X shape to them. All right, sorry, I had a question on Discord for a different class. 
All right, um, are there any questions on DNA structure so far? Any questions on DNA structure? Nope. Okay. Um, I didn't want to go into all this biology going on in here in this PowerPoint slide. I did want to just kind of jump ahead a little bit. Um, I did actually prepare a PowerPoint. Um, I think I'm going to jump to the section here on genetic code. Um, I did mention earlier that uh, the order of, that these are in uh, do give us uh, do you give the enzymes information on what order to build the amino acid peptide sequence in when they're building proteins. And uh, there are a few codons that are significant. So it turns out that uh, these are read in groups of three. Uh, a set of three nucleotides is referred to as a codon. And it turns out each one of these uh, different codons corresponds to either starting to read, stopping, the, stopping to read, and then one amino acids are present. Uh, the start codon is AUG. I don't think that's in the slide here. It's AUG is a start codon. And the stop signals are if, if it sees any of these. So you could think, I, I like to think of you as being the, st the stop command <laughs> almost because these are UGA, UAA, and UAG are your stop signals. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the, uh, the handout that I made. I did post it on Canvas. It's in the module with the other handout. Oops, I just had it. Hang on, code on chart. All right, and I had, there we go. All right, so uh, this here is the codon chart that I'm, I'm, I'm referring to here. Let me zoom in a little. Better? All right. So um, if I gave you guys a um, amino acid sequence, or sorry, a, a nucleotide sequence, you can tell me what kind of uh, uh, peptide sequence would be generated from it. So uh, like I said, you, you ba they basically read in groups of three. So you're gonna look for the first instance of AUG and read that until you find UAA, UGA, or UAG. So uh, let me just go ahead and make some random sequence here. And then we'll take a look. All right. Sorry, I'm just writing up, writing up a sequence right now. All right. <clears throat> one last step here. All right, so here I, I generated an amino, uh, sorry, a nucleotide sequence here. And the kind of question I can give you guys here is what would be the resulting peptide chain from this? So uh, what you need to do is just read from left to right. So this is going five prime to three prime. That's the order that we're reading it. And you want to uh, basically read until you see AUG in a sequence. So not here. Oh, there's AUG right there. This is our start codon. So start, and then uh, basically every three from then on is going to be your sequence until you get to UAA, UAG, or UGA. And I believe the next one here is our stop. So, um, you know, mo most of, uh, uh, proteins, you know, are, you know, thousands of amino acids long, but here just giving you an example of how it works. So it, uh, because... Uh, the start codon is AUG. If you look at the chart here, let me show you how to read the chart that I, I'm referencing. Uh, the way you read this here is we have first letter, second letter, third letter. So our first letter is A, then U, and then a G is down here on the very bottom. So that is methionine. It works out where if, methion if uh, AUG is the start codon, every single amino acid uh, sequence is going to contain methionine because that's the start point. 
All right, and then UAU. So let me slide this over just a little bit. Here we go. The next one with UAU. So it goes U, and then we slide over to A, and then look for U. And then we get TYR for that. And then next one is uh, CUU. So it looks like we're at, hang on. Yeah, CUU right here. So it's leucine. And then AUU looks like it's isoleucine. And then UAG uh, does not have a codon associated with it. So we're now done. So this is a four peptide sequence. You guys could, I think I have a question on, on the short answers where I give you guys an, an, an amino acid sequence and you have to draw me the peptide, draw the structure of the peptide. That would be fair game. I'm actually really liking this idea. You guys like that idea? If I give you guys a, a Amino acid sequence, do you guys draw me the peptide from it, the structure? We can do that. <laughs> I, I won't make it too many peptides long. So that's a good, good, good test type question. Um, one thing I want to say, bef <laughs> say bef before moving on here is that um, notice here how certain codons, will, uh, mo multiple codons uh, call for the same um, amino acids. So for example here, what I'm getting at is how AUU and AUC, they both call for isoleucine. And then uh, we have for the C versions, all the versions of CU, all of them call for leucine. Uh, what this basically is, it's built in redundancy. So it, it, it basically makes, uh, from, from what I, the way I gather it, the reason why there are two uh, things like mutations. So if you have incorrect amino acid being plugged in, the bulk protein may change. Um, but this way, if, if there's a, a little bit of an error, like in the translation on the, on the amino acid, uh, redundancies prevent mutations. So there's a lot of redundancy in, in this chart. So like all the versions of UC, all of them call for serine. And then same for uh, this one here, proline, I think that one was, proline. Uh, all of the CC versions call for that. So yeah, look at, there's redundancy all over the table. Arginine, yeah, serine, threonine, yeah, these all are very redundant, redundancies in the code. So once again, the reason why we have redundancies in the code is to prevent mutations. It gives a little bit more uh, robustness to the, the code itself. All right, um, are there any questions about codons, anything like that? We're actually almost done with this chapter. I skip a lot in this DNA chapter, focusing on the chemistry part. Any questions? I think the last, the last thing I wanted to talk about today was uh, viruses and how they work. You know, I, I re I'm, I'm thinking with uh, the way that, you know, the way the world's going on right now, I think talking about viruses is probably pretty important, right? <laughs> um, let me switch over to the PowerPoint. The showing, yeah, I just need to minimize this one and you guys should be able to see it. There we go. All right, so uh, this particular PowerPoint does go through a lot of detail on protein synthesis, um, RNA, and you know all these different details here. Uh, we are not going over that. That is for your biology class. Uh, this is like several lectures worth of Bio 99 here. And, and I was told that they spent about a week on this stuff uh, in Bio 99, a week or maybe three lectures, depending on the teacher. So um, all this stuff here, your bio teachers will test you on it. If you, if you want to read it again, feel free to do so. I will not be putting a slide like this on the test. One where I have you draw a, draw a codon, that's fair game. Drawing a codon is fair game. Um, the section on mutations we're not going over. It does have a mention in here of redundancy, I think, if you go through it. Um, one thing I do want to mention here is um, oxidizers. Uh, if you oxidize DNA, you can cause cancer. That's a, like a little side note that I usually go over in lecture. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the, the viruses here and how they work. 
So um, viruses uh, themselves, I, I, I've heard some people make arguments about uh, whether or not a virus, is, a virus is alive or not. I, I've seen those discussions before because like what defines something that's living or not? Um, if you compare uh, viruses to say people or even, even, even one celled organisms, there's a lot of differences. They're missing a lot of parts. So uh, one of the most significant parts about viruses is that they can't do basic biological functions on their own. Like uh, one thing I, I would consider to be basic, basic biological function would be to replicate cells. That, that, uh, that is what our bodies do when they're, you know, your, 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 your cut is healing or something on, our, on your arm. You're growing new cells there to kind of uh, seal the wound. Uh, viruses can't do stuff like that. Uh, so basically what viruses are is they are um, a protein package that has DNA in there. And then the, the coding in the DNA helps take over your cells. So um, what happens here? So just taking a look at this picture, let me um, blow up this slide here, actually make it, make it full screen. I should move this, move this picture up there and then we'll do full screen on this. All right, so uh, they only contain uh, three to 200 genes uh, that are infecting your cell. Um, that is pretty small compared to a lot of uh, the genes in our, in our body, uh, for example. Um, as I mentioned, uh, viruses cannot do things like make things. They can't make their own proteins. They can't duplicate themselves on their own. They, re they basically require hijacking some other tools to do it. I, I imagine it's like so some random person walks into a factory and they drop their flag inside the factory. And, this is mine now. You guys are going to make what I want you to make now. And that's basically what viruses do. So uh, viruses right here, uh, we have the, uh, the protein spikes. Um, these will actually embed themselves into a cell and they basically kind of will rip the cell open and then dump its genetic material inside of the cell. Um, once the virus actually gets inside the cell, it basically takes over your, your facilities uh, inside your cell and it'll basically, uh, your, your own cells will start reproducing its, its own virus. And eventually it gets to the point where uh, these viruses will basically get released back out to the bloodstream to go infect other cells. Uh, so the, 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 the cell that's being attacked is referred to, referred to as the host cell. I'm doing over defin definitions here. Uh, the envelope here is basically a protective layer. You know, it does protect itself from the environment. And uh, the capsid, uh, from what I understand, there is gen genetic material inside the capsid. Um, they're also showing it inside, inside the cell here. I always learned that it was inside the capsid. I might be mistaken there. I'm not a biologist. I'm a chemist but I'm pretty sure it's in the capsid. Uh, does anybody know, for example, uh, where the genetic material in the virus is located, in the capsid or inside of the capsid? I don't remember. I'm sorry. <laughs> but either way, it's not all that important if, if no one remembers. I want you guys to understand the basic gist on how viruses work. Um, yeah, I, I remember that too, that it was, it was in the capsid. Someone's confirming that too in the chat. Yeah, the, the, yeah this slide I think has a, a slight, it's, it could be slightly misleading, or maybe they're saying that uh, that whole thing is encapsulating, I don't know, I was, I was heard with part of the capsid. So um, I did want to uh, show you, uh, reference a video. I'm not gonna play it here, but I'm gonna give you guys a link. I highly recommend watching it. Uh, I'm gonna pull it, I'm gonna switch over to browser. So here I'm in YouTube right now. Um, there is a YouTube channel called ASAP Science. You can see I looked for it already earlier. Uh, they did a really good video on how uh, viruses in general work. They're, they're focusing on talking about COVID, uh, but it's a really good video on how uh, the stuff works. They did really good animations and stuff in there. I'm really happy with the video. And let me find, I think it's this one. Yeah, this one right here. What, what actually happens if you get, get the coronavirus? So I'm just gonna get a link. Come on, stupid ads. After protein. Yeah, these, uh, these guys are great. I think they have some good content on their channel and I will share the link in the Discord. I highly recommend watching this video.
All right, um, I'm actually thinking we're at a good stopping point. We are actually at the end of the chapter. It's pretty short, huh? <laughs> um, did you guys have any questions about anything? I'm noticing in the in the in my camera feed there that I need a haircut badly. <laughs> I normally get a haircut like weeks ago, so I need a haircut. <laughs> All right, guys, um, I'm going to hang around the Discord like usual, and then uh, we can talk on the Discord. Yeah, it was quick. It's a short chapter. Um, so uh, if you guys decide to read ahead, uh, we are actually doing the uh, metabolism chapter. I cut a lot out of that chapter. And I actually um, I do more addition in there than actually uh, stuff in the chapter. So I like to go over. Uh, we're going to be going over uh, the, the, the molecules that help with energy transfer. Uh, energy and electron transfer in biological systems, and I want to focus on chemical change. So I will show you structures of like ATP to ADP, and then what's the difference? And then, you know, riboflavin, all the different uh, uh, energy molecules, FADH, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, we'll look at the chemistry. Um, quick... Uh, Why don't you guys, if you, so uh, the question was about trying one of the examples. Why don't, uh, why don't you guys try, uh, so why don't you guys try drawing out this one? And then if you post it in the Discord, I can correct you or not. Yeah, I, I, this is something you should try on your own. And then I, I can help, I can help out with after you tr actually started it. All right. So, all right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and uh, cut the stream here. Uh, what are we at? We're at Wednesday here, so I guess I won't see you guys again until next week. Um, I'm I'm gonna have the quiz for uh, chapters uh, six and ten up soon, so uh, I do not plan on putting DNA in there. It's gonna be carbohydrates and amino acids in this next quiz going up, and then the quiz next week is gonna have uh, DNA and metabolism on it, and then we'll be ready for the exam, and then the final, and then summertime. Yay! <laughs> All right, guys, uh, let's go ahead and cut it here. I'll see you guys later. Stay safe.